start it. All right, good evening, everyone. Recording started. Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started now. So welcome to uh, week two of the Java course. Um, Agenda-wise today, my goal is to basically ensure that you guys are ready for um, assignment two. Uh, probably as you can see from the website, um, the assignment to due date is July 14, so this Friday. So I want to make sure that any questions are addressed and the background for the subject matter is covered. So what we're going to do is we're going to review what we did last time. We're going to talk about these two topics, arrays, string, and string buffer. Then even though I'm doing a review, I'll like to go back and do a review of the object-oriented programming concepts and then go over lab, uh, go over lab two details with, with you. Um, sorry for those of you who are having uh, sound problems, but uh, hopefully uh, what uh, class members have shared would probably work for you all. Now, week one, um, week one we started off with uh, uh, Java basics. And uh, I think for the most part what came out was um, looking at Java foundation or Java basics. So we are, um, we talked about Java as a structured programming language, which definitely it's not, but uh, we were treating it such for the first lab assignment. The first lab assignment really was to was meant to get your uh, get you familiar with Java, so you can work with declaring variables, working with expressions, uh, input output. Hopefully, that was not too much of an inconvenience working with scanner and printf, and uh, then decision making and looping constructs. and uh, writing methods, all of them. So then we started discussing object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming uh, we talk about what is an object. We talked about writing a class and, and making instances from that. And I may have um, we talked about class anatomy, which is talking about creating instance variables, constructors, uh, instance methods, and anything like static, um, 
variables and methods. Folks, please forgive me. Let me assist uh, uh, Aishan, see if I can help him out. Um, Okay, so um, working with class anatomy, like what is the structure of the class and what are all these different components? I might have also uh, talked a little bit about the coding standard, which is, you know, list of things to uh, keep in mind when writing, when writing Java code. So that was what we did last week, for the most part. So, uh, Amav, I'm going to do a full review of this in detail once I get to the OOP review, OOP concepts review part, right, right here. I'll go over how to make objects again at that time. So um, I want to request all of you not to um, think of Java as a, Java is not a structured programming language, even though that's how we start, you know, that's to, you know, the first assignment was, uh, first assignment was merely to get you started with Java. But, you know, first impressions last, which means that, you know, you might continue thinking that uh, Java is a structured programming language and, you know, you basically work with a bunch of static methods. But, uh, it's only in lab one that we work with static methods. After that, the concept of static methods completely, completely, completely disappears. So we start with uh, creating classes and objects. Which is the true slash proper way of working um, working with Java. So now there are a couple of topics we need to spend a little bit of time on. One is arrays. Arrays is basically a, a structure that organizes memory. So arrays are used for organizing memory and each array element can have a dimension. So for example, I can create a, a student's scores array, something like that. That could mean that I have 10 students in a class. and five array elements. So if I give you guys five quizzes for 10 students, I have basically a way to save 50 records. To work with arrays in Java, we import java.utils, java.util, excuse me. So.
So this is representing a dimension. Dimension one and dimension two. So I can use index values to access each one of these. So in other words, if I wanted to say student score zero for um, lab zero is equal to 10, that means student zero at index value zero or student zero lab zero value is 10. So I in effect end up with um, an array of saving a bunch of values. Um, is, are most of you familiar with the idea of arrays from another language? Or does it need clarity? People in the room? Okay, so, so I think we're, we'll keep going then, right? So, so Java has many pre-built functions. So for that, let me uh, launch uh, Eclipse and just show you. So, No, Vincent, there's no difference. You can go either way, you know. So to just add that in the notes that this declaration or this declaration is the same thing. So Java just provides the flexibility, however you want to treat the data type. That's a good question, Vincent, so, right. Now, please have a look at um, this class and um, I guess let's look at um, test. So I'm going to end up creating public class test and we'll add a main in it. Okay. And we're going to declare an array. And then you can see that, I mean, I can declare an array without importing. But if I wanted to use some of the predefined functions, you know, I have something like this. But there's a binary search function I want you guys to see that's built in that I can simply call and there's also a, a sort function right so let me go ahead and start writing some methods so I'm going to write a method we'll make it static for now which is to just print an array So
and I'm assuming most of you are now fairly comfortable with printf at least for the the basic part uh, first couple of lab assignments or a couple of programs in lab one should give you a uh, fairly good exposure So once I'm done with printing this, I'm just going to add a slash n so I can add a line. You can also see that if I put a statement in the middle, it throws, you know, it throws an error. So, so now I've got my uh, you guys can't see the font um, I think it should be in uh, project properties probably. Editor. I'll have to look up the place where we can change the font size so we can what I can do is uh, try and fix that for future so all right so um, we'll just go ahead and call this uh, print method so we can see the values so now what I'm going to do is populate this uh, array with uh, a bunch of values and um, just because I have limited real estate I'm doing all of this in one line guys uh, you guys will obviously end up writing separate lines it's just that I'm trying to fit everything in one screen so you guys can see it So what I'm going to do is go ahead and call the sort method and pass in the array. So this is this is functionality that's pre-built, that's built in, right? So that way you can see the values before and uh, you can see the values before and after. So we print the value of the array before it's populated. Um, after it's populated and then after it's sorted. The point of this is just so you guys can see. Um, the point is, a point of this you can just see is that the The, the predefined functions and Java has a ton of these predefined functions. So predefined functions. The other thing I want to show you guys is 
So let me put this away in your notes. And you all do realize that these notes appear under the announcements link. We can also create um, a ragged arrays. So, for example, I can create an array like this, but say I don't specify the size of the second dimension. So, then what I can do is I can say I want uh, um, zeroth uh, location to have like five subs and just for limiting this to maybe three you know The point is the point of this example is that we are basically making um, the size of the second dimension somewhat variable. So you can in fact like populate the values in each one and use it. length property tells me the size of the array so for example if I have five elements in the array if I have five elements in the array X it's going to return five okay um, and X dot length is a property of the array so it's not uh, it's not a method because it's an instance variable right that's why we just use uh, dot length as a name of a property so you guys understand how a ragged array is created. Basically, size of second dimension is variable. Yeah, size of the second dimension is um, is always variable. Okay. Now I ended up passing the array X to this and what we'll do is uh, we'll go ahead and pass every dimension to the print method. So just so we can have some fun with this I'll say uh, print X of 0. and x of 1 and x of 2. So you guys can kind of see this in motion. And that's what a ragged array looks like, you know, from a, from a size perspective, right? Now, in this case, I'm passing size of, I'm passing the first dimension, which is essentially an array. And an array and every object in Java is passed by reference. 
every object in Java is passed by reference. So, so a few things in this code snippet. Now, there are predefined sorting methods. I think you should, you all should get to know. Insertion, selection, and bubble. These three algorithms, um, I would like you guys to master. Just know that they exist. And so content-wise, when you look under arrays, manipulating data in arrays, and then there's a video lecture on searching and sorting. Uh, this particular uh, video I want you guys to watch. It's a YouTube video. Um, so I'll not cover it in class, like in this live lecture, but, but please watch the video posted under arrays to learn about searching and sorting algorithms. Um, please expect a small assignment um, to show that you in fact know the five algorithms. You never have to use these five algorithms in your coding. I just need you guys to know those so you guys can answer my exam questions. For your assignments, Ratna, please use um, arrays.sort, which is the uh, pre-built one. Unless, of course, you want to build your own library, then then have fun. Maybe you can do a performance uh, measurement on which um, sorting algorithm is probably the best. You know. Anyway. So this will not be like a lab assignment or an assignment, but it'll just be, um, I can just say question set. Now which five? Uh, those are the three sorting, right? And for searching, I want you guys to know sequential search and binary search. And my video is quite detailed, don't rush through it. You know, take your sweet time with it. I think it, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be good that you know those. Okay? All right. The next thing I wanna talk about is string and string buffer. If there are if there aren't any questions on, you know, if there aren't any questions on arrays. And does everyone understand what is passed by reference from 
back in the day? People in the room? Oh well. So this is when you pass a uh, variable by address and it can be modified um, value of a variable can be modified outside of a method just a small um, comment on that Then we have string and string buffer. So string is a data type. So strings in Java are immutable. So you cannot change the size of a string. Just like an array. So if I say string x equals abc and then I create another variable y with the same property. Inside, inside JVM, it's the Java virtual machine, abc is only stored once but used by but used by X and Y. So that way if you go in and you change the value of X so let's say if I end up saying x equals ab. So it's not like we're going to go and modify the abc. What we're going to do is um, ab is stored in a new memory location. And then address of that location is assigned to X. You guys understand what I'm saying? So Y will still continue pointing to um, Y will still continue pointing to um, ABC. So. That kind of shows you how strings are immutable. So we keep declaring strings so JVM can run out of memory if we end up using um, if we end up using a ton of strings. So memory is not reusable. So garbage collection has to pick up, has to reclaim memory. Garbage collection has to reclaim memory.
And then we have string buffers. Actually, let's talk about string objects. So we end up with creating a string object that looks like this. Right? So. so here also X is not reusable. Each time a new object is created, new memory is used. So that's the diff I mean the idea is that uh, when you declare a string like this this is declaring a string literal and memory is allocated on the stack which is very small in size but you push the problem out a little bit and you allocate memory on the heap. So pushes the pushes the problem away from the stack. But still the efficiency of memory reusability is not there. So that's why working with string buffers is better. Memory is reusable. Memory is basically reusable, so. Creating a string buffer is same as creating a string. And this is what is an instance. I think somebody was asking earlier to do a review of how an instance is created. This is how an instance is created, you know. You use the name of the class and use the name of The word instance and object can be used interchangeably. So now how do we work with string buffer? Is the methods that are predefined with string buffers that I think we need to give a quick look to. So right here, you'll see the string and sync buffer classes in Java and some of my notes. And uh, so this particular string buffer class notes will show you all the methods that we have. And please spend a few minutes going through the string manipulation example. So here you can see that is that font size visible? This is in the notes. We basically have um, 
a string buffer created right there. Using print line, we are printing the value of the string and its length. And then using a for loop, we are setting, we are getting the um, where's, we are trying to print the value at a specific um, location in the array. There's a two string function that converts the string buffer to a string. Things that you would not see with strings are right here. Inserting a value, setting a specific character, appending a string to an existing string. So those are some of the, those are some of the elements of value. So strings and string buffers, okay? I think node should act as your first frame of reference. At the end of the day, that's what I'm testing you guys on. So book has so much information in it that it's not possible to cover it all in the first shot, right? In class within six weeks. So there are specific things we focus on. And again, your exam is open book and notes and you don't really have to cram any of these methods. Just remember, you know, just understand them and put them in your engineering handbook. So, or in your notes and you'll have them when you need them. Whenever possible, use string buffer or string, especially if you are changing values. So, especially if the string values are being changed, then we must do that. So then the next thing that we have on this is going to our uh, review of object oriented concepts. If you guys are okay with string and string buffers, are there any questions on string and string buffers? Can everyone still hear me okay? Okay, great. So, 
नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज ओपी कॉन्सेप्ट रिव्यू String buffers can be used with class variables, especially because those are shared. So if you're modifying the values, um, you know, if you're declaring variables as static, then might as well use because you have a little more control as Deanna is saying with memory management which is always a good thing, right, to have. Calling delete does not free memory automatically in Java because the garbage collector has its own uh, way of working. So in Java, we do not have explicit um, way of reclaiming memory. Interacting with JVM can produce, you know, a request. Like, you know, if I make an object like string buffer, So I can say, you know, like instead of using delete, I can say a1 is equal to no. And that right there is sending a message to the garbage collector to reclaim that memory. When will the garbage collector get to that reclaiming of memory? We don't know. It may end up doing it right away or whenever there are CPU cycles. So yeah, memory management is automated. Unlike C++ where you actually have a lot more firm control over the, the memory management. We don't in Java. So working with classes. Let me take a minute and see if I can come up with all the standards I expect you guys to follow. So one class per Java file with exception of inner classes, I haven't talked about inner classes, so we'll get to it probably in the month of August. Variables declared should always be private. Methods and constructors should always be public. Class names, I think later on we'll probably add protected, so at least I'll add that right now, but you know it'll become more clear when I get to explaining what protected is. Class name should start with uppercase letters. Um, if there are any others, uh, guys, please let me know. But, uh,
adequate formatting is important indenting etc so oh yeah writing getter setter methods So because I declare my variables private, I have to write methods to read and write those values. So, so please maintain your own coding standard list, but these are few of the things I think I mean I may have mentioned since uh, since last time. So. So whenever you declare a class, you make it public. And let me see if I can do this in Eclipse. Why don't we do this actually? Take a 10 minute break and we'll resume. Um, so let me pause the recording here for a moment. We'll continue in about 10 minutes, folks. Recording stopped. Recording started. Um, so we'll continue. So working with classes and objects. So generally when you have a public class that you create, I would expect to see instance variables first, constructors, and uh, then instance methods, and then class methods. If there are any static variables to be added, then those can be added here. For assignment two, usage of static variables should be avoided. generally speaking so everything becomes an instance variable so so let's go in eclipse and create a test program If ever the windows in Java get in the Eclipse ID get messed up, you can go in and say reset perspective and you know uh, 
the perspective is basically then reset for you. So here is a test class. I'm going to throw in a couple of instance variables. Um, something like that. And then we're going to write some constructors. So I want all of you guys to pay close attention to what I'm about to show you. It's a feature in Eclipse that helps you write code. So you can go under source and you see how we have all these options. You can generate constructors using fields. Something like that. And since we haven't talked about super, you just remove that. Did you all see that folks? So I must always, from a coding standard perspective, write a default constructor, so I'll need to type that. And then if I'm trying to format my code, I can always go in and say source format. And now the source is formatted. Now I need to write my getter sellers. So I can say source generate getter sellers. And you can choose which ones you want. If you just want getter and setter. And there you go. Now this is giving you frivolous code. I mean, I'm taking here a value of local variable y and assigning it to the instance variable. So usage of this keyword. When you have instance methods, you'll first have getter, getter and setters, and then other methods like maybe print or other calculation methods depending on depending on the class definition so. I would recommend writing a print method each time so the way I would generally do a print method is I would generate a two string method and rename it. So I'm only trying to print the values of the fields, not methods and all those things. So when you do that, it's going to throw this override tag like so. I'll delete that because we don't know what it means yet. And I'll convert this to, uh, you can convert this method to a print method. Keep in mind, um, usage of string buffer over string. <laughs> This keyword is important if the variable name of the instance variable is the same as the local variable. Because I'm using y, I'm also using the uh, variable y as a local variable. Right? There, usage of this keyword becomes very important. Ritika is the question answer. Okay.
So now I can build an object of type test. Please go ahead and ask your question, whatever it is, no problem. Here we are using the default constructor. Here we are using the overloaded constructor. And you can't have two variables named A1 in the same scope, so we'll need to change that. If you change the argument name, like if I change Y to Y1, I can say Y equals Y1 and get rid of it. I think that's what you're trying to suggest. That's totally fine. But, you know, it's auto-generated, it's there, just understand it, use it, you know, have fun. So now we are calling objects. And if I'm working with A2, I can use all these methods. So I have the print method. So main now becomes uh, less verbose. So main is the place where you test code. That's it. So main is the place where you test code, right? And everything else is just now a class. So now it's possible that rather than put the main in the in the class, I can just write a separate class. And I can call it the driver and it can have a main in it and I can put my main method in a separate class that I call that I call driver and the code is still the same because test.java is in the same directory as driver so I can now run my driver and it will show me the output. So I'll say run as Java application. And I guess I don't have my console Time to reset the perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring up the output window, which I can't seem to see. But we basically can have multiple classes like this in one lab. So when you work on your assignment number two, you can have a 
a class for student information as tests, like as I have test here. And you can have the driver class as a separate class. So let's have a look at assignment two, the first part. So it says design a class that will hold all these properties. Now the fact that I've shown you how to use uh, auto code generation doesn't mean you overuse it. Please use it meaningfully. Okay. Please use it meaningfully. So you have to write constructors, getter setters. And then demonstrate the class by creating three instances of a class. You can, you have to use the scanner method to populate the values. Now the question is, um, how is this written and designed? So in Eclipse, What I'll do in Eclipse is the following. Create a Lab 2 project. Lab 2 Part A. That will contain student information class. And it will also have a driver class. So student info class has the properties and methods and print methods that are defined. And the driver will just have a main method. You can probably write uh, write helper methods to read to read the values. Okay, if you have any questions, please let me know. Then comes the question of how do you drawing a class diagram. Um, we will have to manually zip all files. There's no feature uh, and I'll talk about submitting the lab assignment in a little bit uh, once we get through, you know, some some uh, some of these other uh, some of these other details. So, So the class, can I have the student info class non-public and the and in the same file as the driver class? No. That is not making that is not meeting our coding standards of one class per file and the class being public. So as I mentioned earlier, in the coding standards when I started covering. one class per file. So the class should also be class should also be public. So 
So the helper method means that um, so let's say I have my driver class like this. Uh, class names always start with uppercase letters. I'm not going to write the entire main. So let's say you have a main method. And maybe you have a method like public string input name. And then you have statements here. Um, read input reader string using scanner. Okay. So, so you can read a string using scanner. So I can instantiate my driver in the main method. something like that and I can say driver a equals new driver and then I can call the helper method a dot input name or something this is what I mean by a helper method okay is that uh, fairly clear I don't know, somebody had that question earlier, so, so Daniel, is that clear to you? Okay. So now on to how do you create a class diagram? Because I'm asking you all to submit a class diagram. And so if you go back to the assignment two section you'll see this diagram called or you'll see this link for creating class diagram and I have this little picture that I uh, I have this little picture that I show you so, this is how we create class diagram right so we end up with um, a bunch of boxes that are linked with each other Each box represents a class diagram. Uh, each box represents a class. So we have in each box the class name, the properties, and all the methods. Methods as you put together in the methods as you put together in the class. And then we're going to learn about We're going to learn about all these relationships over time. Association, encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, and so on. So those can be shown in the schematic as we go through. Generally, the class diagram is added Uh, generally the class diagram should be handcrafted right and all the relationships shown so in lab 2 part A we'll basically have uh, we'll basically have two 
um, two classes, one showing the driver, the other showing the student information. And because um, there's really no like relationships we have talked about yet, so there is really nothing to map between the uh, between the two classes. So, so no relationship to be shown in lab two uh, part A. Now, if we look at part B, there we are going to have a there we are going to have an association. Uh, so let's talk about what is an association. So we draw a class diagram. Test runs is taking a copy of text in the output part of Eclipse and submitting. Basically, I want to see how you guys test your code. That's the important part. I want to see how you how you all test your code. So, so then for submission, you can upload like one zip file with everything in it. So let's say we have lab two or assignment two. You can have a subdirectory for part one and a subdirectory for part two. The subdirectory for part one has a source folder that has um, uh, it has all the .java files and has test run and a PDF for the class diagram. I don't care what tool you use for generating a class diagram, whether you hand draw it or use PowerPoint or whatever, uh, but you can either submit a, a PDF or a .gif file. Sometimes people take, uh, sometimes people take a picture of, they take a picture of whatever um, they've drawn and, and show that. So. Sorry, I don't know how that popped up. And then same thing for the second part. So this is basically showing all the things you can submit. Any questions on this, folks? Does this all make sense? So if you're using um, what you may call uh, Mac and you end up using a different compression uh, tool, that's perfectly fine as well. Okay. You're supposed to generate one zip file for each assignment. So if an assignment has two parts, then it'll just have two subfolders, but still one zip file. Does that make sense, Misty? Okay. Cool. So, Our next uh, part of the assignment is, or part two, you are looking for uh, passing an object by reference or using the association relationship.
So generally, I'll be keeping up with assignments uh, before the next assignment comes through. I'll be grading the previous assignment. So generally, two to three days after the generally two to three days after the assignment has been uh, submitted. So sometimes uh, an assignment can be a tad bit late by somebody. So I wait for a little bit of time, but you know, we go in and grade. Uh, I'll go in and grade uh, the assignment within two to three days. When you pass an object to another class, that's that's uh, that's passed by reference. And the goal of part two is to basically for you to show how association works. So uh, like I said, class diagrams can be done any way you choose. You can generate it on the computer or you can uh, hand draw it, whatever you prefer. But uh, try and focus on design before construction. So draw class diagram before writing code. I know this is not like normal, but this is how it's uh, this is how it's uh, supposed to be done. So, so here we have class H. And then we have class B. And we're going to write a method in B and we're going to pass H to it. So now H and B are associated. This is what you're going to implement in lab two, I mean lab two part two. So, so we'll say H A1 equals new H. Then we'll say B, B2 equals new B. And then B2 dot G A1 passing an instance of A1 to G. So this is passed by reference. Uh, it's kind of a temporary association. Temporary association. So in part two, You have to do this following assignment. Create a cost simulation program. And the, the simulation program should toss the coin randomly 
and track the number of heads and tails. So we have got all these operations that you can toss the coin, you can track heads and tails. So we're going to try and decide what classes to create. I think I'm going to change this design a little bit. So you can create a coin class. So again, let's go down here and we'll say lab two part two. We'll create a coin class and a simulator class and a driver class. Simulator class will have a toss method. To which coin can be passed. Okay. So we instantiate coin instantiate simulator and then toss the coin. The toss method can keep track of heads and tails as well. And for the random tossing study java.util.random class so okay and that will give you what you need I think That part is left for a little bit of uh, self-study, if you will. Um, then the class diagram will show the three classes. And coin and simulator will show the association relationship. So coin and simulator will show the association relationship. Any questions on lab two, part two? Is everyone doing okay? So, so one zip file shows up that uh, basically is uploaded in Canvas and we are good to go. So this is all I had for today. Um, I'll post the notes and when the link becomes available for the recording, I'll make that available to you guys as well. Java.util.random is a class I want you guys to go a little bit of hunting on and figure out how it's used for uh, generating random numbers. So you can, uh, so you can figure out uh, you know, randomly, when you toss the coin, you can uh, show its uh, heads or tails. All right. So. All right, guys, have a wonderful evening. Uh, we'll see you all on Wednesday, same time, same place. Take care, everyone.